All right, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Dan Katz. Uh, uh, I'm a professor at Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago Kent College of Law, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, uh, serving as your host for this panel entitled Hot or Not, Watson and Beyond. Uh, obviously, in, in, a, in, in computational law, there's a division between sort of rules-based AI and data-driven AI, and this is a sort of data-driven panel that's going to talk about sort of what's going on in, in uh, legal analytics or data-driven legal informatics, whatever sort of terms you want to use. Um, so our speakers are uh, Noah Weisberg, who's the CEO of Cura Systems, uh, Khalid uh, Al-Kofahi, who's the Vice President of, uh, uh, for Research and Development at Thomson Reuters, uh, Charles Horowitz, uh, uh, from the MITRE Corporation, he's a principal systems engineer. Andrew Arruda, who's the CEO of Ross Intelligence. And uh, Hima uh, Lakaraju, from, who's a PhD student in computer science here at Stanford. So our format is we're going to have each sort of speaker maybe give about four minutes of opening comments, and I will, uh, it's my uh, 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 duty and, uh, uh, to uh, ruthlessly enforce that time limit. Uh, so uh, at one, we'll just cut their mics uh, as necessary uh, when the four minute mark is reached. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm going to pose a few questions to the group thereafter, but largely we want to, I mean, we have a lot of great people in the audience here, so we basically want to uh, get some ideas out on the table and then uh, let, let the, the rest of the group sort of participate here. So I just want to offer a few kind of uh, comments at the beginning before we get started. I think it's been a very interesting few years in sort of data science or predictive analytics as applied to law. Um, there's obviously been a significant increase in the number of comp companies trying to do some class of data play in our space. Um, and obviously this is moving far beyond just e-discovery. In fact, I don't think there's anybody from doing sort of an e-discovery on this panel, although that's been obviously a major place where people have been interested in data analytics. Um, IBM Watson uh, is kind of was an early example of machine learning as a service, um, but uh, a lot of other stuff has become available since that was um, made sort of commercially available uh, a few years ago. Uh, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, Google, several other players in the space that are having sort of machine learning as a service offerings. Um, there's also been a lot of open sourcing of tools that were previously not available or only, uh, so Google has just released SyntaxNet, TensorFlow, Amazon's recommendation engine was just open source recently, Facebook's open sourced a lot of their tools, and so the sort of the number of tool offerings that were previously only available in large scale enterprises have now been democratized, which I think is a, pr a pretty interesting development. And so when we think about Watson, there's Watson specifically, and then there's sort of Watson as a stand in for machine learning as a service, as a broader set of ideas. Now, all of that's happened. All these other companies have gotten in the space since Watson became commercially available. And so I think one of the questions I want to put to everyone is what is that going to mean for sort of the wave one legal tech startups that? sort of the cost of, the, all the costs people had to pay to sort of start their companies, a lot of those, many of those have been reduced, not all of them. There's a lot of sort of specialized knowledge in legal that makes it so it's not just a sort of straightforward engineering problem. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pass the, pass the uh, microphone over to Noah, who's gonna offer some comments, and we'll follow the order uh, as um, reflected on the, uh, on the panel. Noah? Thanks, Dan, uh, and thanks for listening to us. Uh, I'm Noah Weisberg, uh, co-founder and CEO of Cure Systems. Um, I think when we talk about Watson, which I think is really amazing sounding technology and other ML as a service offerings, um, we need to think about sort of whether the tasks that they are optimized for are tasks that lawyers do, right? Because I think there's a common misconception that all you need to do is throw some machine learning at a problem and you can solve it. Right, but as someone like Hema, I think could probably tell us in a lot more detail, in fact, the optimal machine learning for any given problem can be quite different, right? So if we were thinking about sentiment analysis, for example, like there's serious debate about what is the state of the art, right? And that debate, like even sort of the experts, I believe, are highly torn over what's the state of the art, even in just one pretty heavily studied area like sentiment analysis. And, and not only is there this heavy debate that, by the way, I don't know that Watson is sort of part of that conversation, right, the Watson people are, even though, again, very impressive technology, but going beyond that, that where you come out on the debate will even depend on what kind of training data you have, right? Like, do you have a large amount of heavily annotated training data might push you to an opposing place beyond even one of the two warring camps beyond what is the best way to do sentiment analysis. So when people are thinking about 
what is sort of, you can just take machine learning that's off the shelf and throw it at a problem. Um, I think they're missing how machine learning today in 2016 actually works. So what we need to do before we kind of breathlessly proclaim that any one uh, machine learning is right for the problem is think about the actual problem you're trying to solve, right? And there are a lot of different problems that lawyers might try to solve. So e-discovery is one, uh, a document classification type of problem primarily. And there are special tools that are actually pretty well optimized for that. Uh, I don't know if any of those tools are available off the shelf, but it's, but it's a problem that is understood. Um, other problems would be like a legal research type of problem, and that's a type of problem, like a question answering type of problem that I think Andrew can talk about a little bit more, but that's a type of problem that Watson might be among uh, the tools that you could use, but there's also a strong DeepMind tool, and there are other perhaps off the shelf machine learning, not commercially available ones that might be really good there. Uh, in our area, which is extracting data out of contracts, uh, we found, we tried, my partner has a PhD in computer science, and we now have several other PhDs in computer science on our team. We initially tried using off-the-shelf machine learning uh, and thought it would take us four months to get our software to work. And in fact, after six months, our software was really mediocre, and it took two and a half years of focused research on our specific problem to get our system to do what we needed it to do. So again, the first question is, is are you using the right machine learning for the job? Uh, the second question though is with all these companies like IBM pouring a billion dollars into Watson um, and other companies like Amazon and Facebook and Baidu and Google having really stellar scientists, um, will they build the one ring to rule them all? Will they build a machine learning that can handle all sorts of problems uh, without needing to be optimized for specific topics? Or will their machine learning be so excellent that even though Recommind or Catalyst uh, or Content Analyst have been working at e-discovery problems for years and pouring pretty significant investments into those, will, will the sort of innovations that these companies are making on the broad scale be such that they'll be better approaches? Um, in 2016, my answer would be not yet. Uh, I think there will be a point when there will be perhaps the one ring to rule them all, um, but we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. Khaled. Uh, good morning, Khaled al Kofahi from Thomson Reuters. So certainly there is a lot of hype around cognitive computing, Watson, and I feel compelled to add to it. So, um, <laughs> you know. That, so you're on the hot camp, not on the course, nice camp. No, well, so, yeah. in the middle, in between. So when we think about it, you know, uh, the promise of sort of intelligent, smart machines making sense of data that are able to interact with people in a natural way and aid their understanding and cognitive sort of processes, I think that promise is increasingly feasible. Don't misunderstand me. Yeah? In a general sense, we will not see such a machine in a decade or two. <laughs> but within the confines of a carefully designed vertical experiences, this is very much doable, and this is, in fact, what we are trying to do, yeah? Um, and we are at Thomson Reuters, you know, I am an R&D, and we are building a center for cognitive computing, and we are hiring, of course, uh, so uh, looking for computer scientists in partnership with IBM Watson. But um, b before, you know, so to avoid any confusion, you know, the solution is not Watson. Watson is part of the solution, so is our other tools and technologies, et cetera. The tool is important. Would you rather chop a tree with an ax or with a chainsaw? But it's not about the tool, it's about the mechanic who is using the tool. Yeah, to solve these solutions, you need significant expertise in the domain and how to develop solutions. You need content, you need tools. But at the end of the day, you know, when we talk about cognitive computing, there are sort of two kinds of challenges that we need to, to, to deal with. There are challenges about the how, how we solve these systems, how we address these challenges. But there are also equally difficult challenges around the what, what it is that we need to build in the first place. And I think 
uh, these challenges, given that we are sort of moving away from just enhancing text or doing simple sort of, well, not, I wouldn't call it simple, sort of isolated task classification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think these challenges in terms of what kind of experiences we need to build for lawyers or even for consumers, yeah, that will allow them, uh, as our previous speaker uh, talked about eloquently, access to justice, for example, these are the things that we need uh, to, to uh, think about. Um, to end with something more concrete, yeah? if you think about, at a high level, what knowledge workers do, at a very high level, and oversimplifying here, they do three things. They find content, they find stuff, they try to analyze it, understand it, and then, then they make decisions. From a content perspective, information providers, including Thompson Roses and others, have created content for all of these steps. In the legal space, the key number system is about finding, essentially. Analytical law is about understanding. And practice guides is about helping people decide. From a technology perspective, we have been stuck, for the most part, in the finding. Yeah? We avoided doing anything to help attorneys, systems, technologies, understand and make decisions. And not just attorneys, accountants, tax advisors, etc., etc. And I think uh, sort of the challenge that we all face as technologists is that I think it's time for us to move up the value chain. And in addition to solving <coughs> some fundamental problems and, and challenges with findability, it's also time to move to understanding and decision making. So, thank you. Okay. Hima, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hima Lakaraju. I am a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, so my area of research has been, you know, basically how we can use machine learning to benefit decision makers in domains such as judiciary and healthcare and so on. Alongside, I've also been looking at how can we build machine learning models which are useful to them and more interpretable. Uh, so I have been a part of like you know tiny part of the Watson group which was working on a text analysis uh, uh, you know like the subcomponent of Watson and uh, you know talking about the hype around Watson or the hype around machine learning so though AI or machine learning basically started as something which was like a one size fits all you know with that goal that you know we'll develop one algorithm or like a set of algorithms which can be used for every task on the planet. Uh, it has kind of unfortunately or fortunately diversified to an extent where now it's like for every special or dedicated task you have a separate learning algorithm. And given that, a lot of the responsibility actually lies on uh, you know, the person who is using the algorithms, as was already pointed out by Noah and Khalid. Uh, so a lot of it is actually boiling down to like how do you formulate or how do you ask a question? Because off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms are available. But I think it's up to you know, the people who actually want to employ them in a domain. You know, for example, like, do you want to do a prediction? Do you want to do uh, you know, an Analyze the causal effects. So, what is that specific task that you're, you know, looking at becomes the most important thing, and that formulation, of course, lies in the hands of, you know, the person who is actually trying to use these uh, machine learning tools to some extent, right? Uh, so, as I mean, as far as like AI as like a one-shot fits-all goal or one-size-fits-all goal, I think we are like kind of far away from there at this point, as Noah rightly pointed out. Uh, but I think at this point, though lies with you know the people who are actually employing machine learning and uh, my two cents about Watson so Watson has you know it has like lots of components it's super useful but its primary goal or rather the way it was looked at in the initial stages of development was to be geared towards question answering so in fact, some efforts have been going on. This, I mean, my knowledge is kind of a little outdated. Maybe somebody else on the panel can update more. But the efforts that have been going on were like, you know, how can we employ Watson to healthcare, for instance? And then the problem again boils down to what kinds of questions would people be interested in answering? And how do we tailor that to that, right? How do we tailor you know, the Watson learning algorithms to that? So in some sense, I mean, uh, so I would like to uh, just say this much that 
So AI and machine learning, of course, which is its sub-branch, uh, are like pretty useful in general for uh, various applications or various other domains, ranging from healthcare uh, to judiciary, law. Uh, but I think at this point, they are still at a point where a lot of the responsibility or a lot of like how well you can use the tools available, whether it's Watson or you know whether it's another uh, bunch of tools which are available off the shelf primarily lies with the person who is intending to solve a problem. And how what you get out of those tools depends on how well you can formulate your problem. And so that's the bottom line at this point in time. Great, thank you. Andrew, so, please. So hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Ruda, <coughs> CEO and co-founder of Ross Intelligence. And uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been blasted by our media attention, what we do is uh, we're, we're creating an AI assistant to help lawyers with their legal research. Um, I want to talk about three things uh, here today. I want to talk about what's hype and what's reality. I want to talk a bit about how technology like Ross, like the tools that, you know, the companies that are represented up here are building can bridge the <coughs> divide in access to justice. And then I also want to leave some fun announcements because what's, uh, what's a big event like this without some big news as well? So in terms of the hype versus reality, I think we're already touching on a lot of it. You know, you hear Watson as almost a replacement for machine learning or natural language processing itself, and, and that's not what it is. It's one, one packaged um, machine learning as a service, natural language processing as a service tool that you can use to build your greater tool. So think of it like this, you're building an engine. And Watson can be part of that, but depending on what type, what, what you want your car to do, what kind of racing it's going to do, you're going to add different things. You're going to go out in the market and you're going to say, say, can we buy this? If it's already there, you add it in. Or you build it yourself in-house. And so that's how we approached solving the problem that we're solving, which is combing through a ton of legal data and helping lawyers find the answers they need. We heard earlier today that we have this huge problem in law where something like 80% of individuals who need a lawyer can afford one, and it's you know, very appropriate we're at a law school right now because you also see statistics that a lot of recent graduates can't find work. So I think that tools that are enabled by machine learning, that are enabled by natural language processing, that are enabled by AI can help bridge that divide because there's a lot of inefficiencies. We're talking about filling out repetitive forms. We're talking about searching through vast quantities of data and doing question answer, which is actually something that machine learning really excels at. And so I think that the future can be very bright when you start implementing and using these tools. The last thing I want to touch on is we recently announced that uh, Baycross Dettler was a commercial partner of Ross Intelligence. And that was pretty exciting because they represent a really strong national firm. But I also want to talk about how Ross can be used at a variety of other institutions. So another use case of Ross is at large international law firms. And so another commercial partner of ours is Latham and Watkins. And so we're really happy to announce that here today because it really represents the fact that Ross is something that could be used at one type of firm, at a small type of firm. We're also going to be making some announcements, and I hope is to do this, where I release a press release about all the solo practitioners that are using Ross's technology. Because I think that technology also has to be used from the smallest law firm to the largest. On that note, um, in terms of a regional powerhouse that's also using our product, uh, Von Briesen and Roper um, out of, out of uh, Wisconsin is also uh, a commercial partner of ours. And I really love what they're up to at their law firm with really using technology so that we can do the things that we're talking about here. Changing the legal industry from within. Law firms that are using technology, using machine learning to make a difference. And so I want to thank everyone uh, for, for listening and, and giving me some time. And I look forward to the questions and, and getting into discussion about machine learning. OK. Chuck. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, so I thought about this penultimate question for the panel, hot or not. Uh, so, so I'll say, from my point of view, very hot. <laughs> uh, and, and perhaps for a couple of reasons and a, and a contradictory thought. So one would be understanding, yes, IBM is not the beginning and end of cognitive computing, but they are certainly, without uh, mistake, betting a big part of the company on, on the future of that technology. It's not the first time they've done such a thing, but it's still important when they do. Uh, and, and more importantly, besides having the technological base for doing that, uh, that is a company that has all the resources needed to push that vision forward. So uh, marketing and 
higher education, business development, venture capitalism, government relations, industry partnerships, computing services, global services and sales chain, et cetera. Uh, they can do that. So that's really a pretty big sign in my point of view. Uh, and second, unlike some technologies, uh, this one, cognitive computing, portends to uh, present the opportunity for an industrial revolution in knowledge work, so humans and machines teaming. Um, and that broadens the stakes, increases the interests, and so uh, I think it gives it a much better chance of being successful than uh, if it were a much more uh, specialized um, application. Uh, but contradictory to that, so I, I'm a believer in the hype cycle, probably a lot of you already know that, mm -hmm. but it's a Gardner pattern says that for technology enthusiasm, says real life uh, thwarts excessive zeal, uh, but that we eventually come to be disciplined in applying technologies in sustainable ways. So, uh, 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 so I'm conscious of that, but I, I frankly uh, am not certain have we already gone through that trough uh, or between Jeopardy and AlphaGo, uh, are we not quite there yet? So I think it's hot. That may mean we're on the hype cycle. It may mean we're going to have a couple of tough years ahead of us. Um, so the real question, the ultimate question then is, what does that even mean to the legal profession, if it's hot uh, or if it's not? And frankly, I think that uh, it means the same thing in either case, uh, for, uh, and that's that the legal profession has some notable impediments to deal with. Uh, and I think two of them are, are one, uh, in some circles, Lawyers are not viewed as creating value. They protect existing value. And so I don't think it's very likely you're going to be uh, showered with adoration, as in the healthcare industry, for example, uh, to improve yourselves through cognitive computing. Um, and second, as has been noted at length yesterday, uh, uh, the legal profession has a legacy of uh, humans. Uh, human data brings a lot of difficulty and a great challenge to share that legacy with machines in partnership. And so uh, my thinking is uh, a course of action in light of those impediments, whether it's hot for the legal profession or not, uh, is for the legal tech industry and the legal profession, portion that is interested in this subject, uh, should affiliate themselves with an industrial activity uh, that is creating value that does depend on cognitive computing, that has inherent requirements to interact with the system of law, uh, and position themselves as enablers rather than a general counsel coming in to impede progress, um, and to do so in an environment where there is no great legacy of, of tough data. Uh, so it, it met perhaps an obvious, or maybe the only example would be self-driving cars and the autonomous systems. Uh, uh, action activities that are going on. And, and that is a place where uh, I think lawyers could be uh, contributors to the design of those future systems rather than the general counsel who has no role in what computational law means uh, in that environment. Okay, so just carrying on with this theme, I wanted to p propose something to, to the group and see what they think. So. Uh, um, so filling on in this machine learning as a service idea, uh, 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 in a number of conversations where people have described kind of the what's the next wave going to look like, it's, uh, so this was a statement. Well, really, it's just going to be a workflow across the MLAAS, the machine learning as a service spectrum. So, hey, what, you know, IBM's got, uh, um, you know, Alchemy, so I'm going to use Alchemy to do any extraction. Then I'm going to use this thing from Google, and I'm going to use this thing from one of the other offerings, and really that the custom val the, the value proposition is be able to build a workflow across all of these uh, um, sort of machine learning as a service offerings together with some sort of custom stuff that you build yourself and that that's actually what a lot of these sort of let's call them tier two and even some of the companies represented here will start to become uh, to look more like that. I just wanted to get people's take on that as a sort of is the unique uh, under the hood is the unique value proposition the workflow across the machine learning as a service spectrum. I don't know, Noah, if you had some thoughts about that. So, so it depends, right? Like, I think that's a really compelling possibility. Yeah. Um, but you really, for me to say yes, I would have to know that there is an ML as a service offering that can do the core things that I need well, 
right, like entity extraction, there's probably a few choices that can do that pretty well. I don't know if they would work as well as us on contracts, but they might, right? And if someone was building it anew, it might be easier than building it from scratch. Right. But would they do the core things of like document classification better? Again, maybe document classification is a pretty well understood problem. Right. But if you're in an area that's not well understood, like for us, contract data extraction was a few years ago, and I right. still think it is. Um, then in that case, you're probably going to be better using like Kira.ai, our API, or okay. something like that, and you might stitch that. So you're in the, you're maybe going to have an as a service offering also? Uh, question mark. Yeah, I don't think we're uh, exactly going to be fighting out uh, Amazon. Or yeah, it's a fairly well, narrow but, thing. But, but in actually, the world, I think what know. we're uh, what we're talking about doing. Uh, fits in really well with what you're talking about yeah. doing, which is for one specific set of problems, like, is great, right? Because people who know for one specific set of problems can come to us and right. get that little specific problem where we're great solved. Right. And then go to others for a lot of other problems and stitch them together. And right. I think that can make for very interesting businesses. Like, in fact, you think about the big e-discovery companies, a lot of them really are system integrators. That's right. Right? And so they're doing it with not machine learning necessarily. Maybe they're integrating a bit of machine learning. Yeah. But they're also integrating like an OCR component from someone else and a document viewer component right. from someone else. Labor arbitrage. Right. Yeah. And yep. just taking different pieces built elsewhere. So I definitely okay. think that is a future that can happen, but I just don't know that all of that ML as a service is going to be the like Amazon ML, even though I'm sure it'll be terrific. Okay. Others, the others have thoughts on that. Feel free to take a contrary position. That's okay I, too. I, mean, I, I think sort of that's the natural progression of things. Yeah. Uh, several years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago, we were talking about individual algorithms, support vector machine regression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we are talking about functionalities, name init extraction and resolution, classification. Under the hood, there are likely different algorithms that together give you this functionality. I think the next step is frameworks, yeah? But I don't think we are there yet because no. of the, the need for sort of creative solution, problem analysis and solution design. Um, there isn't necessarily a repeatable process that we can apply to any, every problem. For certain problems that are very well understood, yes. I think name into extraction with some flexibility around the main adaptation, you know, name into the news is different than contracts, yeah. Um, we'll get there sooner than later, but I think there is still a significant way to go. So there's one, that or we can ask other questions if we want. Well, uh, 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 oh. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I had some thoughts on that, which is, uh, so first of all, machine learning as a service, given what we have as of today, it seems like if you're talking about machine learning as a service, particular for certain law applications or, you know, certain healthcare applications, uh, let me be a little kind of ambitious and say that that is probably a possibility. But if you're talking about machine learning as, you know, this is again like a service that I give for a doctor or, you know, some healthcare professionals to a judge or to, you know, lawmakers and so on, that is probably a more, you know, distant possibility. So part of why there is this difference is that a lot of machine learning relies on feature engineering. Yes. Which means, you know, you take the data, you craft the features and then, you know, because that's very domain specific. The part of just crafting the features is very domain specific and that's why even some problems as you know standard as document classification the classifiers that you that work well on certain domains may not work on the right. others just because of you know the underlying feature space yes. being different but uh, let me no free lunch theorem yeah <laughs> right and right before our eyes right, right. yeah and uh, given that, let me also kind of say something uh, that, you know, so since feature engineering is like the main, uh, you know, kind of like the point or the pain point in this entire workflow, a lot of focus these days in machine learning has been towards algorithms like deep learning, uh, where features are not necessarily provided by the people at the end, right? right. So they're automatically learned. So given that that's the direction in which the field is going, yeah. maybe there is some hope to see machine learning as a service. Okay, very good. Um, well, I'll just say real, as brief as I can, I think that if you uh, <laughs> look at uh, software development as a model, the maturation of tools over the last 20 years has made that a manufacturing process. It's very manageable and very well understood. And I think there's a natural instinct to presume the same can be done with machine learning. And I think you'll see people will experience uh, quite quickly that it's a very frustrating thing because, yes, it depends entirely on 
expertise and data, and, the, and neither of those really are true with software development. So the, the as-a-service part is not unimportant if it reduces the cost of engaging in that, but it's not going to make it any simpler to uh, be successful. But I would say that if you give us 20 years, yeah. you'll arrive at the same point of maturity that the capabilities to do so will improve, but it's going to take time. Okay, so I mean, part of this panel is about the hype cycle, which has certainly been, you know, obviously some of the media has been reporting. Uh, uh, it, it, there's no way to live up to what's been what's been what's been stated, but uh, it's not required for us to live up to that, uh, even if it's directionally accurate and the time timeline is inaccurate. But I'd like to give us if you guys wanted to do like a one minute, thirty seconds to one minute on, you know, what's hype and what's not hype, and as of right now, 2016, uh, uh, and then I'll open it up and, and to the to the crowd who can uh, yell at us. For for a little while, okay. Start down there. We'll start down there. Yeah, Chuck, go ahead. If you want to, if you have anything, you. I think. No, I think it's your typical blend. I'm sure there is hype, and that. Well, I'll just go back to IBM. The executives there, the people you see in the TV ads, are the first people to say they're hostage to their marketing system. That is way ahead of what they're really able to achieve. And quite frankly, IBM, the government, healthcare industry, pretty much everyone has deeply misestimated how hard this stuff is to apply successfully. And uh, uh, th that's troublesome, but that's what it looks like when you start something this I'll important. I'll throw in one other thing. Are there, is there one area that isn't being well-developed right now, one either topic, problem type in law, or tool in law that hasn't been used successfully, if, if anybody, you know, to the extent that you think it should? Uh, about that, or the hype, or you can talk about the hype cycle, Andrew, your choice. Well, I'll talk about the hype cycle. Okay. Um, I think that um, sometimes when you talk about machine learning or AI, it seems like we're already hit singularity like three years ago for some reason. Yeah. But I like to tell people that it's really day one, but on day one, we're already finding use for it. So just because it's early doesn't mean that it's not already doing things, but it's certainly still early. And I do think that what's great is when you do kind of get together a system that actually does work, by the very nature of what machine learning is, is that the system continues to improve. And so it's like pushing snow down a, a hill full of snow. I'm Canadian, so most of my analogies include snow. Um, <laughs> it, it, that, that keeps picking up and, and gets larger and larger, and I think we have pushed it. I don't think it's anywhere near the, the end, and I don't think we're anywhere near um, a situation where uh, you'll have like a, like a fully functional AI lawyer. That, 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 that it's impossible. Yeah. Ima, do you have At anything? this time. Sure. Uh, so let me kind of talk a little bit more in terms of the specifics of where, you know, what machine learning uh, is being hyped up and what is not. Uh, so particular to machine learning of late, as I just mentioned, there is a lot of attention to something called as deep learning, which is you know, supposedly solving problems in computer vision, natural language processing, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Like just today morning, I saw a science article about it also being uh, detecting how people age and so on. Uh, while that that's all true, and there is a lot of kind of you know power to these kinds of models. Uh, the the fact, or rather the sad fact that does not come up in the media, which needs to a lot more often, is that these models are still in such a phase that people spend months together just parameter tuning. So it's not something that's as ready as oh, so we are at a point where you know I just throw my data at something and you know magically I get answers to all kinds of problems. We are at a point where we are seeing some kind of convergence towards uh, you know a learning algorithm or algorithms which can solve a variety of problems. But at this point, we are still at a phase where you know it's a lot of human effort in you know tuning the parameters, making sure the model works, and so on. So I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Please, so, please. so I think this notion of robo lawyer, robo advisor, robo this, robo that, that's pretty much hype, yeah. Uh, however, a cyborg is not necessarily a hype, yeah. That's a machine that complements uh, sort of a professional. If, if I think about areas that I think will, we will see significant improvement in, uh, dialogue systems comes to mind. And by dialogue, I don't necessarily mean speech utterances, sequences of speech utterances. I mean collaborative systems that, whether it's text or speech or visual interactions, uh, that's, what I, you know, that's what I mean by, by dialogue systems. Uh, again, in the context of tasks, yeah? Because to develop something useful, 
you need to start with a task. And the idea is over time, the question is over time as we solve more, more and more of these tasks, do we, do we become better at them and can we generalize them and leverage them in more general uh, purpose sense? And that is a question that is, I think, yet to be answered. So there's a ton of hype, there is some reality. Uh, on the hype side, I would put a lot of articles that you see about this is going to be the future. Like, we intend to use Watson to do X, right? Like, until you see real results, to me it's hype. But there's tons of real results coming from machine learning where it's changing our lives. Like, you used to get tons of spam, now you don't. I drove past a self-driving car yesterday. Like, ow! Uh, translation. Right? I can read a Swedish web page now, and my Swedish is pretty mediocre. There, are, there is software that actually writes news articles right now. Software can classify my images. In law, like e-discovery happens using computers where they're doing a ton of the classification. It's not doing everything, but it's doing lots. In contract analysis, stuff that I used to do as a junior associate, like, people are doing that in 60 times the speed, thanks to technology like ours, that's helping them actually do it automatically. So there are things, and there are people who are actually being helped by machine learning in reality, but there's a ton of intent to use, and I think it's really easy to confuse intent to use with these people have been using this technology to do X, and it's resulted in time savings or accuracy increases or betterment of life Y. Right, and so I think if you don't see the meat, it's not there. Okay, uh, well, uh, I'd like to open it up for people to uh, ask questions. We have the, the microphones on, on, uh, at the two, two locations. Uh, while, <laughs> while Adam's walking up here, let me, uh, uh, I'm just encouraging everyone to continue to, to push out things on Twitter and also that there's the evaluations of each of the sessions and I'm supposed to mention that, so I've, I've met my obligations now. Adam? Um, thank you guys very much. I, I, I'm really thinking a lot about Hema's point about the formulation of the problem. Um, and I Can think you introduce it, yourself just oh, for everyone? Yeah. I'm Adam Long, and this is my fourth one of these, and I just think it's great, so thanks everybody for doing it. Um, and I'm an attorney and, an, and an, I guess I need to know how to say that right, entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm spending a lot of time personally thinking about uh, machine learning and AI and, and, and the law. And I think one of the things, I don't even know how to formulate this question, which is ironic because my question is about how hard it is to formulate the question. Okay. It's I a meta think, question. Yeah, it is sort of like there's a meta, yeah. maybe somebody can Recursion tweet about that. To infinity. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about Donald Berman and Carol Hafner's paper from 1989 about AI and the law where they said, look, this is the problem. I talked to the broker about my house. He told me he didn't know if there's any water. As far as he knew, there wasn't any water damage. And turns out there was. And now what? Do I have a case against this guy? That, that a, lot of the, a lot of the questions that people have are not, they don't come very well formulated. And a lot of, and a lot of what a lawyer does, I think this is also true, by the way, in the <coughs> medical side, is say, well, I, I need to pursue this a little further. You're looking at this as a copyright question. Right. I could give you an answer to the copyright question, but actually you've got a contract issue and, and other things. I, I, I guess maybe this just comes down to saying, when are we going to have robo-lawyers? But, but I'm, I'm curious to hear... All You're asking you, an issue spotting question. Yeah, we're well, looking for like an issue spot or a sort of you know a triage machine that would sort of identify what a person's problem is from their self characterization of their problem. Is I, that a correct way of saying it? I guess that's what I'm at. I mean, okay. how are we going to get to the point where the issue spotting is happening right? And whether that's an issue spotting machine or maybe that's a new way we're training lawyers. I'm I'm just curious for your thoughts on it because maybe uh, I'll, I'll take a fair shot. I think the, the challenge with sort of. Um, the search engines that we all have been developing over the years is that our view of the user is extremely narrow. When you think about it, the information need does not start with the first query that I see in my system, and it doesn't end with the last document that the user clicks on or opens. The information needs starts much, much, much earlier upstream with the event, with you, go, with, with, with you going to a lawyer about uh, uh, with a complaint, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is where I think 
the point of interaction between user and machine needs to start, not with the query, because there is a lot of analysis, mental analysis that happens between the issue, the information need, and the first query. And I think there is a significant opportunity uh, right, there, right, right there. So other people have a burning response, otherwise we have three people in 10 minutes, so. Sure, uh, so. Uh, Th how about 30 seconds, go ahead. Sure, uh, thanks for the question actually. That's a very good point because I think that's primarily one of the reason why there are a lot of barriers to other people's entry into machine learning. Like for instance, you know, we are having this conversation here about, you know, how law can benefit from machine learning and so on, right? So, but the truth of the matter is that a lawyer or a judge or, you know, anybody who is not familiar with these systems cannot just like come ask a question and get an answer because a lot of it boils down to asking the right question and picking you know the right solution for that and that's why though we kind of openly encourage saying you know maybe people in the law uh, should not be spectators they should get more involved into how these things work how these models are being built there is a gap there because clearly like you know it's not as simple as they ask a question and you get an answer. So uh, that's actually a very good point. Uh, and I think part of that is why a lot of like these, you know, so there is also like a spectrum where, you know, there is a, uh, you know, an end kind of an application user, like maybe a judge or a doctor or somebody, then it passes through the data scientist and then it basically <coughs> comes to the machine learning person. So that entire pipeline currently is just existing to mitigate the problems that you're suggesting. Right? So there is a lot of scope to actually do stuff there, and I, I think that primarily that's the reason why there is an entry barrier for somebody who is not familiar with these things to like actually get use out of machine learning. Okay, we have three, three questions in 10 minutes, so we keep your responses right to the point, straightforward, here we are, here's your question, also keep the questions the same way. No meandering, let's just have the question, all right. <laughs> I'll do my best. My yes. You're, you're meandering already. Yes. <laughs> My name is Victor. I'm an attorney at uh, Oregon here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, my question is regarding uh, funding. No, you made an observation that it took you much longer than you expected to build the product. And given the expense of these expert machine learners and the uniqueness of the data, I find it difficult for a startup uh, entrepreneur to be able to fund this to a point of prof profitability. And so uh, my question is, how would you advise such a person to accomplish these tasks? So maybe Noah and Andrew would be the ideal people to answer that. Uh, uh, Andrew said a little less. If it's okay, if we'll let Andrew go first, then Noah. Okay, go ahead. Andrew, have at it. <laughs> I'm on a clock now. Yep, uh, clock started already. I would find, you'd be surprised how many lawyers are in venture capital. <clears throat> and if you find those allies within those funds, they'll be able to help you navigate that and be a strong advocate. So for example, with our tool, that we showed them what we could do, and then they saw what was existing on the market, and that they understood it and they understood the market and you can kind of make a lot of progress that way. So I would suggest doing that, but you also see a lot of communities popping up um, where they have kind of uh, local uh, investors that they can in really invite you to. So check out Codex and then it, uh, up in Canada, there's LegalX, uh, Le LIZ, there's a whole bunch of places. Okay, so, Noah. So we took a very different approach. Uh, we worked for free, basically. Uh, my partner, who has a PhD in CopSci, and I uh, both worked for free and actually poured a bunch of our own money into the business for long enough that we got it to work, and now people pay us, and we've expanded, and all that kind of thing. Um, it's really hard. Like, it really take, can take so much longer than you expect to get your system to work right. Uh, but if you do, it's pretty fun. <laughs> OK, Thanks, great. Not so much fun when it's not. Hi, my name's Emma. I was just wondering whether you had any comments on how to close the gap. What skills and capabilities do lawyers need to work better with you? Because obviously, as lawyers, we don't like numbers, and I'm probably not going to become a data scientist anytime soon. So any comments would be appreciated. So I actually have pretty strong views on this, that the best lawyers to work with machine learning tools are lawyers who are actually good lawyers. Right, like we hire a bunch of people who are actually like very competent lawyers to help teach our machine, right? Because if you have a system that's learning from people, like with machine learning, it really is garbage in, garbage out, right? Like you need quality trainers. So as a lawyer, I wouldn't even stress about knowing the data science. Like we literally have one person who I think is a grandmother who helps train our system. Like not to say that older people can't uh, know this stuff, but just to say like, you know, she is not part of the born digital generation and you can figure 
that part out if the system is simple enough, but really just focusing on lawyering skills and focusing on being an expert and then having a system that can figuring out being open to collaborating with a system and having it learn from you, I think it can be fine. Like I really don't think you need to pick up the science. I'll just say I think that's quite right, and I um, it is a multidisciplinary activity, and I think it's romantic to think of a single person who's good at everything they need to be, but there are probably some of those people right here, but they're scarce. So Can I repackage your question just slightly and say, um, uh, what's the minimum amount of, of expertise that one needs, if any? Maybe you guys take the view yeah, that there's none. I'd say zero. It'll lower the cost to those people, and you'll have a lot more of them to draw upon. And as I say, there's no reason to do this in isolation. You'll have a team of people who bring the strengths and competencies needed to this problem well beyond one single person who's good in the law and computer science. More, more attitudinal than expertise. Okay. Right? Like you have to be willing to embrace the idea of working with a machine, and you do have to be expert in something that the machine can learn from you, but beyond that. Okay. I, I totally agree, I think just very quickly. That I think in the context of cognitive computing, I would add a sense of uh, information architecture and knowledge representation. Because if you want to teach the machine the concepts and the relationships between the different concepts, then you need to have a sense of, of, of how information, how to capture information and represent it. Yeah, I guess I will personally file a dissent because I think some level of numerical literacy is what it means to be a 21st century professional. And we have these lawyers who say, I'm not good at math. That's sort of a, a pathology that should not have been allowed to last this long. So I'll just file a dissent since nobody else seems to represent the opposite, of, well, opposite view. Okay. Dan, I agree with you, but okay, I... Okay, good. good. I just <laughs> out. That's it. <laughs> okay, We're that's it. More, yes. yeah, next question. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Look at all the fun we're having. Uh, Sabiq Pradhan, I'm a grad student studying ML and mach machine learning here at Stanford. Um, so Khalid mentioned about moving up the value chain with, le with this um, AI-enabled tech to like more understanding and decision making, and not just um, you know not just data finding. But my question is, how do you get the credibility for that to work? Because when you're because you know when you're uncovering information, you have the information there, like you have the proof that it works. And when you think about like the financial industry as they started to adopt AI techniques and in investing, like you could see the returns that materialized or in some cases didn't, and point to that and say, hey, look, this AI is actually helping, it's working. But how do you get something similar when you're dealing with like trying to incorporate ML more thoroughly into your decision-making process? Like, How do you build up that credibility that you need to get adoption? Well, I think for us, uh, legal research is a quantifiable time. You spend a certain amount of time on it. And I also think that coming out of 2008, where clients really pushed back and, and really changed the way we do business, we saw a huge amount of pushback on how much they're willing to spend, and legal research time has been something that they have been refusing to pay for. So I think what you need to do is, it's about finding the right problem you're solving and sticking to it. So then you can go to a law firm and say, how much time uh, do you currently spend on legal research? How much time are you writing off for that time in legal research? And now, after you've used Ross for X amount of time, has that changed? If it hasn't changed, then that's a problem. That's my problem. If it has changed, then it's no one's problem. We're winning. And so I think you just have to narrow what you're doing, find it, and then stick to it. This is, this is trivially easy, right? Like, with ours, you have people review contracts the regular way. You have people review contracts using our system. Mm -hmm. And you see, are they what happens to their accuracy? Are they the same? Are they more accurate? Are they less accurate? Fortunately, more accurate or the same. Uh, secondly, how long does it take them to review documents? Like we had a client the other week that was telling us they used to review three contracts per reviewer per day, and now they average 60, right? Like it's a measurement, like it's actually tangible. At first, when you're small, you're gonna have to do the measurements yourself. Over time, or if you're TR, you can actually pay like people with PhDs to do the research for you and publish papers. Uh, but if you're small, you can't do that, but you can easily run your own experiments for like not a lot of money, right? Like you could, if you were trying to play in the legal space, pay two lawyers or pay two law students. You could probably get them for like 20 bucks an hour and have them run for like a five hour experiment, right? Drop 200 bucks and you can actually have evidence. And then over time, as you get clients actually using your system, you can fill that in with much better data. But, but this is not a hard problem to solve. Uh, and it is a very worthwhile problem, I will say, in building a business, very worthwhile problem to solve. Like, being able to tangibly say not our software makes people faster and better, but say that, like, and we've run a test, and here's what we did in the test, 
makes a huge difference for marketing purposes. Uh, I think the problems may be easy to solve here, but, uh, you, but the issues you raise up are not uh, at all certain in the public policy space. So the White House is just now initiating workshops to talk about fairness and transparency in artificial intelligence, and what does that mean? We already have problems now with existing systems and less understanding of how AI is going to uh, 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 change those things. Okay, well, we have about, uh, about two minutes left. I'd like to give each of the panelists uh, about 30 seconds for a final thought. Uh, I'll start with you, Chuck, at the end, and we'll bring it back down this way. Well, all right. So I promised my son that I, he's 11 that I would share his advice for the computational law, the good of the computational law. Uh, somebody in this room has got to get a job with Mojang. This is a Minecraft. Somebody has got to deliver computational law to Minecraft. A lot of money in that industry. And if you want the youth of this country to fall in love with the law and appreciate the value of the computational law, that is the place to do it. So that's my good. serious Do it. Uh, I'll, I'll end Hard with, to top that, but I'll, go for it. Uh, I'll end, well, I'll try. I'll end with the words from Zoolander number one, but I haven't watched Zoolander number two. Watson machine learning, hot. So hot right now, Dan. All right. All right. Okay. Keep raising the stakes, Dan. Now it's your turn. <laughs> I'm not going to try and compete with them, but let me just say this, that so I think uh, machine learning can actually bring a lot of kind of positive Im impact in other fields, including policy or healthcare. But I think the, f the issue that we face as people who are working in machine learning, as somebody pointed out, was that uh, how do we know our systems are doing well, right? And you guys will be the best judges of that. Uh, so I think only like people in law can actually help us in figuring out how to make a machine learning system learn better, or are we learning something that's useful to you? So I think uh, you know I would actually encourage or urge all of you to like you know collaborate with the machine learning folks and you know basically benefit from all the uh, you know advancements there, and also provide your insights to us so that we can develop better algorithms. Thanks. I will raise you, Andrew. So uh, I, I will use a, a quote from Hemingway out of context. Machine learning and AI will happen gradually, then suddenly. And if you are not in it, you are out. <laughs> OK. So uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to more uh, give his approach to this. Um, He'll be quoting Plato for this one now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're chopping down a tree, a chainsaw is a great tool. but you need to be sure you're chopping down a tree because if you're trying to cut through jello or steel or rock, it may not be the right tool and you need to make sure you bring the right tool for the job or you're going to get suboptimal results. Okay. And uh, now, as Plato said. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a good, it's a good finish. So I'll, I'll just throw in one for myself. Uh, I think there's not been enough public display of an external validation of a number of the products people are trying to sell in this space. So if you looked at what happened in eDiscovery, they did these tournaments, the Trek did these tournaments where they, you know, for better, for worse, but largely for better, I think, because there was at least, people had to go into a neutral field and try to test their tools. We need to have that across a lot of the tools that we have here. That's a way to smoke out what's actually hot or not. And so validation is something that we need to, you know, entities like uh, uh, Stanford, uh, um, I'd like to do that at Illinois Tech and some other places would be, would be, it'd be a good thing for us to do to try to help the market make better sense of what's going on and what's real and what isn't. So with that, I think uh, I'll pass it to Roland. Uh, uh, Thank you again, everyone, for Thank a wonderful you. panel.